super fancy. Didn't phase her at all. She had also stated that her husband was fine with her having affairs because he could no longer have sex or do any physical activities with her anymore ever since he had battled cancer and developed chronic back issues. That's really sad. When Jason was asked how he felt about Kelly's affairs with men in his interview, Mm -hmm. he told police that he was not okay with it, but that he'd rather have her around for as long as he could rather than let her divorce him. Because she stayed with him through his bout with cancer, and he didn't want to let her go. I get sentimentality, but also... What? So we're painting a good picture of the type of people these are, Yeah, super classy. There's a lot of stuff there that's that's not right. After being questioned by the police, the two of them moved back to Merrillville, Indiana. Oh. Where they were both originally from. Oh! Nobody could stop them from making the move because police didn't have enough concrete evidence to charge them with Chris Reagan's murder. They also still at this point haven't even found a body. Laura Frizzo, she was determined to do whatever she needed to solve this case. And after the Cochran's moved back to Indiana, Laura seized the opportunity and got a warrant to search the house now that it was mostly empty. Yeah. Weirdly, they left a lot of stuff behind. Oh, not surprising. It seems like they move really quick. A lot of their belongings had been left behind, such as a loaded twenty two caliber gun found under the TV. Great. The biggest... Under the TV. So not only are they leaving a loaded gun, but also a TV, so they left, like, whoa quick. Yeah. The biggest indicator that they were on the right track with this investigation, though, was that right above the front door when they walked in, there was what appeared to be blood splatter on the ceiling. Outstanding. Laura went as far as to hire a psychic medium. So no wonder you like her. I I just love her so (laughs) much. (laughs) So she hired a psychic medium to come to the house and see what she could pick up on. Mm -hmm. The medium told Laura that before she had even walked through the front door, she saw a vision of a man, which... Her description sounded a lot like Chris, Uh who had walked through the front door. He went up a few stairs to his right, and there's a little bit of a blur after that. And sometime later, he notices that something isn't quite right about the situation, and he turns to leave the house and exit, but is hit by something really abruptly in the head, and then it all goes black. Okay. All right. The medium actually thought that it was a baseball bat. Okay. So this is a super small town, as we know. Mm -hmm. Where was this person from? Where was the medium from? I don't know. What if it's a small town and people know that this investigation is ongoing? Yeah, everyone is super gabby in tiny towns. It's real hard with mediums because you have to make sure that they don't know anything at all about the case. My old teacher lives in a house that's really close to my grandfather's property, but all of the other neighbors are over a mile away. And I know everyone's in business because when my mother goes up there, they all have chats with her and Barb comes and talks to her like the small town bitty bullshit. Maybe. I mean, I don't know where she was from. I don't know how far she would have traveled to get there. So that's an important option to weigh. Frizzo at this point was stretched to the limit because her small police force was already investigating two unrelated homicides. Retired Michigan State Police Sergeant Michael Neger volunteered to help. So good guy. Yeah. Michael conducted a fresh search of Chris's car. He found multiple fibers, lots of hair. He found a stocking cap. But the most important thing that he found were dried leaves caught and smashed into the seal on the trunk door. Okay. He noted that Chris had no trees by his apartment, but that the Cochran's house was completely surrounded by them. (laughs) And wanted to take the leaves to find out what kind of tree they came from so that they could hopefully place a location. I'm going to guess. The trees that were on their property, were those were those the trees that those leaves came from? Uh, one would assume at this point, right? <laughs> so he and Frizzo also discovered something else really interesting. The GPS in Chris's car places him at Kelly's house the night that he went missing. They kept digging deeper and started looking now into Kelly's internet browsing history. Here's a direct quote from Michael. Sometimes people, when they're going to commit a crime, will go and search stuff on Google, like how to dispose of a body. The evidence I found on the computers were Google images, specifically satellite imagery of the Caspian Pit. The Caspian Pit, like how ominous and amazing does that sound? (laughs) The Caspian Pit is an abandoned mine pit outside of town. It's filled with deep and murky water. Divers, when they went into it, didn't find Chris, but they did find a burn barrel. Oh. Interestingly enough, 
the Cochran's had a burn pit in their backyard. Oh, how funny. But the barrel from it was missing. Oh, weird. And there's no way to say 100% whether or not this was the missing barrel from their backyard at this point. But it's certainly an interesting coincidence. Yeah, no kidding. Kelly and Jason Cochran, they told relatives that they were tired of being harassed by police over Chris's death. Which, once again, at this point, they haven't found a body. I I feel like they consistently step on their own toes. They do. And Kelly, who had been having a whole lot of affairs up until this point, started another affair with a woman whom she asked to enter into a serious relationship with. And the woman agreed because they were, I don't know, they were getting all the feels or whatever. Right. So shortly after that, Kelly places a frantic 911 call. And she states that her husband wasn't breathing and before that had been vomiting. Ah. Jason Cochran was already dead when the ambulance had arrived. Huh. When medics arrived, Kelly was acting frantic, getting in their way, and generally just overacting to put on a real good show. Outstanding. She also told them that Jason had overdosed on heroin in an effort to explain the death. When word had gotten back to Iron River to Laura Frizzo about Jason Cochran's death, she knew instantly that Kelly was the one that had killed him. Yeah, no kidding. In an interview, Laura had this to say about it. Quote, I knew that Kelly killed him. I think that she killed her husband because he was a liability for her. She was concerned that he was going to end up talking about things and that she was going to end up getting into trouble. The suspicious death of Kelly's husband gave Chief Frizzo an opportunity to get Kelly to talk about Chris. Laura then got in contact with Hobart, Indiana, police detective Jeremy Ogden and asked him to speak to Kelly himself. Mm-hmm. Did she try to get in his pants? She, she did. Seemed, oh, she did. She had a weird instant oh. attraction to the detective. Oh, I'm so and sure. And was real flirty with him and started to open up more than she should have and was beginning to incriminate herself. Awesome. So she Good then job, idiot. She then chose to flee the state and <laughs> was apprehended in Kentucky oh, where she God, was detained. And Detective Ogden was there in an interrogation room with her. She had then confessed to him that she had killed Chris Reagan. Not her husband, though, also. Just just Chris? She said that she and her husband Jason had killed Chris Reagan. She didn't say anything about Jason. Nah. According to Kelly, Chris was at her house that night that he went missing. And the two had just finished having sex. They were on top of the stairs embracing. And that's when a bullet came flying through Chris's head. Jason had shot him down, and after that, Kelly and Jason brought his body downstairs to their basement. Okay, so she's incriminating herself for the disposal, but not for the actual murder. It's a little more complicated. She's blaming her dead husband. Well, she's definitely blaming him, but the truth about what happened there is a little more complex than that. Well, I would assume that the truth is actually true. In the basement, the two of them put his body on plastic tarps, and then they dismembered him with an electric saw. After they had dismembered the body in the basement, they ditched his car at the park and ride, and then they went and scattered his pieces throughout the forest somewhere off of the highway. They don't even know. She had, like, a vague idea, but she didn't know exactly where, because it was dark, and they had his body parts in a so wheelbarrow. They were just and his body and parts in a wheelbarrow, and they were just, like, scattering them left and right. Hansel and Gretel. Basically. Trail of body parts. How else are you going to find your way home? So the couple had apparently made a pact in the beginning of their relationship that if they ever cheated on the other person, they'd have to kill the person they cheated with. That is why, to this day, Laura Frizzo questions whether or not there are other bodies out there that have never been found. When that information came out, it also came into light that when Chris Reagan was shot in the head... Mm -hmm. Kelly was looking into his eyes, holding his attention, because it was planned and it was known that Jason was going to shoot him. Oh, good. So that that's why she is such an awful person, because she was part of this plan. She Well, I never doubted that she was not part of the plan. Yeah, but she was trying to tell police that it was this big surprise that happened. And so I'm going to divert his attention, you're going to come out, and then you're going to get your rifle, and you're just going to, boom, put a bullet through the head. They did it with a rifle? Yes. How was she super comfortable? First of all, rifles are a bit hard to aim. That's what I thought, too. It was a twenty two caliber rifle. She was, like, super solid, like, hey, yeah, fire gun near my face. Like, this is cool. Exactly. But it also speaks to, like I said, 
what kind of people these were. After that, Kelly agreed to go back to Iron River and help police find Chris's body, or his body parts, rather. She actually said that she wanted to do it because he needed a proper burial. Uh, Yeah, it just took you a really long time to come to that thing. Precisely. So Laura, along with two officers, escorted Kelly around the woods and then back to the house to gather body parts and evidence. This entire time that they were searching for the body parts, Kelly was not even slightly phased. In fact, she made light of the situation, ate pizza, smoked cigarettes. Perfect. This was like a vacation for her because she was out of her cell. She was scooping up body parts like they were flowers. When they were in the woods and they had finally found Chris's skull lying out in the open, it had a huge bullet hole right through the side of it and exited on the other side. Laura says that when she found it, she got down on her hands and knees and she hovered above it and she looked it in the eye holes and she said, I finally found you. Oh, that's kind of sweet. And actually, it gives me crazy town goosebumps because the interview I was watching with her, when the host of the show asks her about that, she starts sobbing. She was so happy that she finally found him. That's how I was when I found the skull. I was crying, I knelt down, and I was just like, I found you, Chris. That's really sweet, though. So, at Kelly's trial, she detailed exactly how Chris's body was dismembered. During her trial, tried to blame Jason for everything, stating that, quote, When he cut him up, he had one of his hands and said, This is the last time he would be waving at me. He was waving goodbye to me with the severed hand. What an idiot. Kelly Cochran was charged with first-degree murder and received life in prison. Yeah. High fives. I'm so excited about my story because it ends in such an amazing, positive way. I know, and you actually told me that it ends really positively, (laughs) and and here's where I'm at. I still, knowing that information, was like, oh no, is she out on the streets right now? Do I have to go to India? No, no. Okay. Are you ready for this? Yes. Prepare yourself. I am prepared. Laura Frizzo and Detective Ogden are a couple now and oh, planning to get married. Oh, that's very cute. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really funny, too, because in the interview, she was talking to her and she was like, so I would imagine that Kelly Cochran's probably not super thrilled about you and Detective Ogden dating. Outstanding. And she was just like, hmm, no, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I would visit her in jail and- together. To and see that reaction. So that's my story. No, and it's awesome. I hope that you like it. But everybody, if you're interested in that, should definitely watch that show that's coming out. It's called Dead North. It's going to be on Investigation Discovery. Well, even now that I know the information about it, I'm still watch it. So what are you going to tell me about? So the Coley Mental Health Center in Anna, Illinois is what I'm going to tell you about. Anna, Illinois? Yeah. I originally was going to do the Mantino one. Oh, okay. But I found out something about this and it... It seemed really interesting. Okay. History is not great. I found out a term that I've heard a lot, what Mm. it actually means. I thought I knew what it meant, but I don't. (laughs) And I was upset. (laughs) The town of Anna was platted on March 3rd, 1854, and was named after Anna Davis, who was the wife of one of the first settlers. Historically, it was viewed as a sundown town. This is where I'm saying that I heard... I've heard this so many times and I was not truly aware of what it actually meant until I started reading articles from this town. The towns were named across the United States for the often posted signs that stated that colored people were to leave town before sundown. I honestly, and this is where I was in my like little weird bubble, I honestly thought sundown town was something that meant that it was like good timesville after nightfall so it was like gambling dens and and burlesque shows and whatever an occurrence in 1909 had a mob of white citizens that drove black families out of town after the lynching of a black man in a neighboring town a historian even had recorded that for many anna stood for ain't no negroes allowed that's really fucked up yeah Luckily, the town hasn't maintained those sentiments today. Is the hospital still open to this day, or...? Yeah, so right now it's the Collate Mental Health Center and Developmental Center. They actually have events there. There's one that's called the Color Festival, but I'm not sure exactly what that pertains to. Funded by an act of legislation in 1869. In March 1875, the North Wing was completed and ready for occupancy. The original site was around 290 acres, and some of the cost and labor was donated from citizens in the county. Okay. It was always intended to be an asylum, 
and to house people who are mentally ill in any capacity.